Hello and welcome to ATP Report. I'm Barry Newsbaum. Before we get started and you hear about our tremendous guest we have today, I want to remind all of you out there in ATP land, if you haven't already signed up for our free text message alert system, please do so by simply taking out your cell phone, opening up a blank text message and write the letters T-R-U-T-H in the message box, the word is truth, and send it to the number 88202, push send. You'll be signed up for free. You'll get all of our content like today's show in the palm of your hand, absolutely for free. Okay, it is my big honor to welcome to the show esteemed Islamic scholar, Robert Spencer. Robert is the director of Jihad Watch. He's a Shulman fellow at the David Horowitz Freedom Center. Get this, he's written 21 books including New York Times bestsellers, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Islam and the Crusades, The Truth About Muhammad, and the best-selling The History of Jihad from Muhammad to ISIS. And brand new book coming out, Did Muhammad Exist? Welcome, Robert Spencer. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Barry. Always good to talk to you. So let's start out with your area of expertise, uh, Islamic Jihad and the source of most of it in the world, Iran. Um, the election for president is over in Iran. The hand-picked, elected, I put that in quotes, new president uh, who surprisingly won, <laughs> that's a joke, is um, Ebrahim Raisi. And he's not just a hardline jihadist, but he's a mass murderer and a big time one. And more importantly, he's very proud of his background. He's accused by the world of having personally supervised the trials and executions of somewhere between five and 40,000 Iranians in the 1980s. He is personally sanctioned by most of the world, including the United States, who cannot even legally talk to him. And meanwhile, this guy calls himself a defender of human rights when asked about the mass executions. The guy is a world-class war criminal he ran the death panel that sentenced political prisoners to death at the end of the 1980s. How bad is this guy? And why was he picked to be president? Well, Barry, the first thing we have to know about Ibrahim Raisi is that these things that you have just described, as far as the Iranian mullahs are concerned, are not a bug, they're a feature. It's not that they picked him in spite of his terrible record. They picked him because of his terrible record for two reasons. One is domestic and one is international. Domestically, they're sending a message to the Iranian people who remain discontented in large part with the Islamic regime that they are not going to be able to dissent. They're not going to be able to protest. Anybody who expresses any kind of public disagreement, it's very clear what kind of treatment they're gonna get with Ibrahim Raisi as the president of Iran. And the other thing is, as you noted, he was not elected, he was selected. He was selected by the Supreme Leader of Iran who is the real power in the country. And he's going to execute the policies of the Supreme Leader. The Supreme Leader's disposition toward his own people and toward the world is revealed by the person he selects to be the president of Iran. By picking Raisi, the Ayatollah Khamenei is not only showing that he's gonna crack down harshly on dissent within Iran, but he's showing that he understands that with Biden's handlers running the United States, that the United States is weak, is not gonna stand up to him. And this is his time to step up Iran's support for terrorism worldwide, supporting Hamas, supporting Hezbollah, supporting Palestinian Islamic Jihad. The Iranian, the Iranian regime has also in the past supported Al Qaeda and the Taliban and other Jihad groups, as well as and this is much less known, but it's in my book, The Complete Infidel's Guide to Iran. Uh, the Islamic regime in Iran has also supported far left groups in Spain and elsewhere. It's clear that they understand that leftism is corrosive to Western civilization and they wanna destroy Western civilization. So they support the left. And so oh. what we're seeing is an increased belligerent on the part, uh, belligerence on the part of Iran. And Raisi's ascension to the presidency means that it, uh, Iran is going to be strutting around and sponsoring terrorism around the world and cracking down on its own people within the country. Well, I, let me capitalize and, and draw attention to the one word you used, um, 
at the end of your explanation, which was terrific, Robert, which is this guy is flaunting his aggressiveness and he is being very clear to send a big middle finger to the rest of the world. He announced this week in his first press conference, he will not allow the negotiations that are going on in Vienna to take place if they include any discussion on their long range missile program which is startling given the fact that the UN has placed Iran on the restrictive list regarding their ICBM developments. The only reason to build long range missiles is it's a platform to deliver weapons of mass destruction over thousands of miles, which puts all of Europe, Great Britain, Israel, and eventually Washington DC within range of Iranian payloads. There is no reason to build weapons like this, none at all, unless you've got a weapon to deliver, i.e. a nuclear weapon. And get this, Robert, to make it worse, he says they're going to abandon all negotiations with the United States unless all sanctions are lifted first. How is it possible that the world is letting them, the Iranians, get away with this? Well, that's exactly it. They know the Iranians, that is, that the world will let them get away with this. And so they know this is the time to press forward with all our demands. The mullahs understand the world in terms of strength and weakness. And they look at Biden's handlers, they see weakness. They look at the leaders of the European Union, they see weakness. They don't see a single world leader who has the guts to stand up, the spine to say no to them. And so they figure this is the time to act. This is the time to make our demands. And we know that our enemies will fold like the, 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 the houses of cards that they are. You know, when I saw this state, the things that you just quoted, when I saw those statements earlier, it reminded me of Hitler. When Hitler said at the beginning of World War II, I have seen our enemies at Munich and they're weak. And that was one of the reasons why he was emboldened to act. And Ayatollah Khamenei is exactly the same way and is acting in, in, uh, upon exactly the same kinds of assumptions. Yeah, the irony is that in many books, just to, as an aside, Robert, that were published after World War II, um, taken from the diaries of Hitler's generals, um, a number of them wrote in their diaries if Great Britain had stood up to Hitler at Munich and not given in to his seizure of land that was, this is all I want, and then you'll have peace, they would have killed him. But when it turned out Hitler was right, and the, the Western Europeans backed down, there was no stopping him, and 100 million people died as a result. So, so Raisi has right. one more comment that I find really interesting. He's demanding that the United States show their honest by lifting all sanctions in exchange for, get this, nothing, nothing, Robert, in exchange from Iran. In other words, open up commerce, let the money flow in, let the oil flow out. You guys can build all the ICBMs you want. And well, we're not gonna check anything. We're just gonna make a new deal. Why in the world would the United States agree to reward Iran now when they are literally weeks away from building atomic weapons, they may already have enough enriched uranium, Robert, to put together five bombs tomorrow morning. Why would we lift the sanctions now? Biden's handlers have to have this agreement. They have to have this nuclear deal. And why do they have to have it? Because Trump said that it was a terrible agreement, the original nuclear deal. And Biden's administration to a tremendous degree is all about how Trump was wrong. And it's all about how the foreign policy establishment that has been in power in Washington for decades and for one small four years was not directly in power, not completely in power, although there was the deep state resisting Trump every step of the way. But for four years, they were not in power and Trump showed them up and made peace between Israel and Bahrain and the UAE and so on and the, the, the Abraham Accords. And he showed that the so-called experts didn't know anything and that the so-called amateur was showing them how it was done. And so now these career 
bureaucrats, career diplomats who've made nothing but mistakes throughout their decades of pub, so-called public service that has enriched them immensely, unimaginably, they have to reassert that they were right all along. And so they have to undo everything Trump did and do everything Trump didn't do. So if he was against the Iranian nuclear deal, they have to have one. And it doesn't matter how bad it is. It doesn't matter how disadvantageous it is because they have to show up Trump. They will sacrifice the peace of the world to show up Donald Trump. Well, let me let me give you a detail that you may not even know about. I, I read this three times in different sources to make sure I was getting it right, Robert. Iran is now demanding that not only all sanctions that have crippled the Iranian economy must be lifted immediately, but we have to put in writing as part of the new JCPOA that sanctions will never be re-established against Iran no matter what they do. In other words, the only punishment we had short of bombing the reactor sites is economic restriction on trade in order to bring them to the table. Trump was right, it worked, and now they're demanding that we promise never to have sanctions again. And something different between this and the last time when the JCPOA was put through without and over the objections of the Congress, which I've maintained for the entire time is an illegal act that the Senate should have been involved in and was excluded by Obama. Republicans now seem to be standing up and seem to be saying, it's against the law to do business with Raisi. He's a world sanctioned war criminal. You can't lift sanctions unilaterally and you can't make this deal without us. Will the Senate Republicans be successful stopping Biden as they were unsuccessful in stopping Obama? I don't trust the Senate Republicans to ever do anything right. They're spineless, they're weak, they're just, just what the Iranian mullahs think they are, they're worse. And so uh, it may be that by some uh, accident, by some uh, good fortune that surprisingly comes down upon us that this will all uh, be done in the way that it ought to be done in regard to these uh, restrictions on Iran, but uh, the Senate Republicans have been, you know, one of the things that was revealed most important, one of the most important revelations of the 2016 election, and nothing has happened since then uh, to show it to be false, is that the United States is not really a two-party system, but there's, there's, there are two parties that are actually one big party that has the same point of view. And then there was Trump. And so without Trump there, there are a few, a handful of Republicans here and there who really want to restrain Iran, but otherwise most of the Republican leadership will just do what the Democrats want them to do. And that is to capitulate to Iran. Well, as I've been saying for the last zillion years, the constitution is very clear, Robert, of relationships with foreign countries that are codified as a treaty or a mutual contract of any kind between the United States and a foreign power must constitutionally uh, be included in the Senate discourse to advise and consent. O'Biden, <laughs> O'Biden, Obama and Biden are both intending to bypass that system. And I think if there's a couple people in the Senate that have the chutzpah to stand up, they had to send it to the Supreme Court because bypassing the Senate and making a treaty that, as you said, could end the world civilization is potentially an existential threat, the likes of which the world does not face, but for Iran. I hope you're wrong. So do I. But you may not, you might be right. We'll see. Thanks for but... coming on today, Robert. Uh, would you tell people where they can get your information and learn about you and what you're doing? Yeah, I, I'm at jihadwatch.org, which uh, is updated many times daily with news and commentary on jihad activity that you will not find anywhere else. And also at jihadwatchrs on Twitter, the new book, Did Muhammad Exist?, will be out in the middle of July and is available for pre-order now, uh, along with my next book, The Critical Quran, which will be out in November. Unbelievable. You are a treasure educationally. I wish the entire ATP world 
would sign up to get educated because there's no other source like Robert Spencer. Thanks so much for joining us today. And remember all of you out there in ATP land, I, I asked you in the beginning, I'll ask you real quick now, sign up, get our stuff for free. It's on your cell phone. Simply text the word truth in the message and send it to the number 88202, push send, you'll be signed up for free. For ATP Report, thanks for coming on today with us. I'm Barry Newsbaum.